everyone has heard of the Holocaust of World War II, when millions of European Jews and others were murdered by the Nazis. Many people are also aware that some non-Jewish Europeans risked their own lives to save them, the most famous being Oskar Schindler, who is credited with saving 1,200 Jews. But there were others who are also less well known, including the humble Italian Giorgio Prolasca, who saved over 5,500 Jews from death, far more than Oskar Schindler did. In 1992, evidence emerged he saved an additional 60,000 people from a planned massacre by the Nazis of the Jewish Budapest ghetto, just before the Russians took over the city. Giorgio Prolasca was born in Como, Italy in 1910, but spent most of his life in Padua. Ironically, as a young man, Prolasca was a fascist who fought for Mussolini in Ethiopia in 1934, and in 1936 he fought for Franco in Spain. When he returned to Italy in 1938, the country had changed. Mussolini had adopted Nazi racial policies, which led Prolasca to quietly abandon his former belief in fascism and decide that from then on he would be loyal only to King Victor Emmanuel III. The new German racial laws of 1935 severely tested his ardent patriotism. Many of his friends, both in Padua and in the Italian army, were in fact Jews. I was neither fascist nor anti-fascist. I was anti-Nazi, he would say much later. Nevertheless, he was appointed to the Italian government and given diplomatic status. He was sent to East Europe and ultimately Budapest to procure meat for the Italian army which was fighting the Russians. There he observed the dreadful massacre of Jews, Serbs, and other minorities. With the fall of Mussolini in July 1943, the Hungarian government took Prolaska prisoner. After months of captivity, he took advantage of a medical pass he had been issued, permitting him to roam freely inside the boundaries of Budapest, and he sought refuge in the Spanish Embassy in hopes of obtaining asylum as a former pro-Franco soldier. That very day, Giorgio became known as Jorge and was granted the same rights enjoyed by all Spanish citizens. Outside the Embassy, he had noticed thousands of people milling around. He was told that they were Jews pleading for the so-called Letters of Protection, which Spain, together with other neutral governments, including Portugal, Switzerland, Sweden, and the Vatican, were issuing to protect Jews from deportation to the Auschwitz gas chambers. Prolaska volunteered to help. He set to work making essential contacts in various key Nazi ministries and bribing, blackmailing, and charming officials and police into helping him, or at least into turning a blind eye to his pro-Jewish activities. In November 1944, with the Russians approaching Budapest, the last remaining Spanish diplomat fled the city, leaving the embassy officially closed. But the diplomat had forgotten the official embassy seal, and Prolaska set to work fraudulently stamping documents which proved not only that the embassy was still open and functioning, but that he was the last remaining Spanish diplomat. The Hungarian government believed him, and he used the seal to issue thousands of letters of protection to Hungarian Jews. Until they could leave Hungary, he housed them in eight rented apartments, which he made sure flew the Spanish flag and therefore, Prolaska argued, they enjoyed diplomatic protection. The bluff worked, although he had to patrol the houses night and day to make sure that roving bands of Nazis did not break in and murder or kidnap the people housed there. As the Russian army approached Budapest, Hungarian officials ordered Prolaska to empty his safe houses of all Jews. He used his business contacts to keep thousands fed, moving them to safe locations, and smuggling those he could out of Hungary. In December, 
he grabbed two boys from a freight train headed for Auschwitz, earning the wrath of Adolf Eichmann, the German officer tasked with transporting Jews to the death camps. In retaliation, Eichmann ordered the Jewish ghetto blown up, while it still housed some 60,000 people. Prolaska demanded an audience with the Hungarian interior minister and threatened legal and economic punishments against the 3,000 Hungarian citizens he claimed were in Spain. It was a bluff. It is believed there may have only been a few hundred at the time. The minister didn't know that, so he overturned Eichmann's orders. The 60,000 Jews in the ghetto were saved from certain death. When the war ended in 1945, Prolaska returned to Italy. He did not speak about his actions, even with his wife. However, those he saved never forgot him. They finally found him in 1987, living a quiet life in Italy. Israel officially made him a righteous among the nations. Dr. Hugo Dukes, one of the Jews saved by Giorgio Prolaska wrote, on this occasion, we want to express the affection and gratitude of the several thousand Jews who survived, thanks to your protection. There are not enough words to praise the tenderness with which you fed us and with which you cared for the old and sick among us. You encouraged us when we were close to despair, and your name will never be omitted from our prayers. May the Almighty God grant you your reward. Perleska claimed he was no hero, however, saying that all he did was tell a lot of lies. He certainly did, but they were lies that saved lives. Giorgio Perleska died in his home city of Padua in 1992. The Mafia, the most famous and well-known of the so-called secret criminal societies. There have been thousands of films and stories about it, and our society seems so fascinated with the Mafia, we can never get enough of it. Though the Mafia may make good entertainment, in reality, the Mafia is the scourge and shame of honest Italians the world over and many Italian-American organizations work every day to combat the glorification of such common criminals and thugs. In Italy, there are several secret criminal societies, the Mafia referring only to the crime syndicate of Sicily. The Camorra, the Andraghetta, and others operate in different regions of Italy. The word mafia has been traced by scholars and may mean swagger, boldness, or bravado, and some believe the word originated in the Arabic language. Sicily, especially Western Sicily, has a strong Arabic history, and it is in Western Sicily that the mafia is most dominant. Historians believe the Sicilian Mafia developed in the 19th century during the Bourbon reign, coinciding with Sicily's transition from feudalism to capitalism. The feudal lords kept order with their private armies, but once they disappeared, bold individuals stepped in to fill the void. These individuals quickly gained power, offering protection to the populace, and called themselves men of honor a term that modern Mafia members call themselves today. It wasn't long before their once noble purpose degenerated into illegal activities, and today the pizzo is the price Sicilian shopkeepers and business owners pay to the Mafia for protection. This usually means protection from the Mafia itself. Eventually, the individual mafiosi formed larger groups 
and developed secret connections to consolidate their power. They became an exclusive group and developed extensive rules and rituals to make it very difficult to become an equal. Once you achieved membership, there were many benefits. You became untouchable by the others, and this was enforced with deadly revenge on those who tried to hurt you. Of course, there was a price to belong. You had to participate in many illegal activities, culminating with murder. In a secret ritual, a candidate who had committed enough crimes and had a sponsor from the group swore allegiance to the death while burning a holy card of a saint smeared with the candidate's own blood. As a full member, called a made man in the American Mafia, you had to follow many rules, and they were two that were most important. First, you must never break the code of omerta, or silence, if you were ever captured by the police. Second, to prevent infiltration of the organization by secret police or other enemies, a mafioso must never introduce himself to another mafioso whom he does not personally know, even if he knows the other through reputation. If he wants to establish a criminal relationship, he must ask a third mafioso whom they both personally know to introduce them to each other in a face-to-face -face meeting. This intermediary can vouch that neither of the two is an imposter. These rules work to ensure that the Mafia was a fortress of secrecy, impenetrable by outside forces. With such strength, Mafia power grew to encompass almost every possible source of illegal income, from protection rackets, cigarette and drug smuggling, prostitution, murder for hire, control of labor unions, and everything in between. It is reputed that the Mafia played a large role in World War II, working with the American army to liberate Sicily. And in America, it has been rumored that even presidents sought the help of the American Mafia more than once. In recent years, Mafia members have been willing to break the code of silence and turn state's witness. The most notable of these is Tommaso Buscetta. Buscetta was a lifelong member of the Sicilian Mafia who specialized in cigarette and drug smuggling. He operated in Sicily and Brazil. He became disillusioned with the Mafia after the murders of many of his close family members. And in 1984, decided to cooperate with the Italian authorities. Buscetta revealed to judges Giovanni Falcone and Paolo Borsellino the inner workings and organization of the Cosa Nostra, a term Mafia members used to describe themselves. He also gave information on the Sicilian Mafia Commission. This resulted in the famous Italian Maxi Trial in 1986, the largest anti-Mafia trial in history. Over 475 Mafia members were indicted, with 338 convicted and jailed, many serving life sentences. The story does not end with the trial. In 1992, both Falcone and Borsellino were killed a few months apart. A disgusted Buscetta gave further testimony linking Italian politicians to the underworld. He also elaborated in great detail how individual mafiosi owned certain politicians. Buscetta entered the witness protection program in the United States, where he remained until his death in 2000. By natural causes. Buscetta's willingness to testify significantly damaged the power of the Sicilian Mafia. His understanding of the Mafia way of life brought light to their hidden secrets. A man of honor to the end, during a trial in 1993, the Mafia member Salvatore Cancemi confessed to Buscetta 
that he had strangled two of Buschetta's sons to the death. After the trial, Buschetta embraced Kanchemi and said, You could not refuse the order. I forgive you because I know what it means to be in the Cosa Nostra. Thanks to men like Tommaso Buscetta, Giovanni Falcone, and Paolo Borsellino, the grip of criminals on the throat of the Italian people has weakened, and in our own country, many Italian-American organizations work tirelessly every day to discourage the glorification of the Mafia and the identification of the overwhelming majority of honest Italian Americans with them. As Dr. Vincenzo Solaro said in 1905, as the founder of the Order Sons and Daughters of Italy in America, and I quote, Today I have a dream, and I hope that someday, even if it takes a hundred more years before we are fully accepted, our children and their children's children, even if they carry a single drop of Italian blood, will be able and proud to continue to carry on our traditions, our culture, and our language. Giuseppe Garibaldi perhaps the most important figure in the creation of modern Italy. Garibaldi fought for Italian unity and almost single-handedly united northern and southern Italy. He was one of the most famous and most celebrated military leaders of his time, and he has been hailed as one of the fathers of the fatherland for his contribution to the Italian Risorgimento, which unified the fractured nation under one rule. His conquest of Sicily and Naples, which had hitherto been held by France, hastened the unification process and made him a national hero of Italy. For centuries after the fall of the Roman Empire, the Italian peninsula was divided into many small kingdoms and dukedoms, which waged wars on one another through the years. Many of these kingdoms were ruled by foreign powers. In the year 1807, the year of Garibaldi's birth, there were nine major kingdoms in Italy, and the Papal States were ruled by a powerful Pope who served as both a political leader as well as a religious leader. Other kingdoms were the Kingdom of the Two Sicilies, Tuscany, Venezia, Modena, Piedmont, Parma, Lombardy, and Sardinia. The Kingdom of the Two Sicilies was ruled by France, and Austria and the Habsburg dynasty had control of much of the north. Garibaldi wanted to set up a free republican government in a unified Italy. He was born in Nice, which is now in France, but at the time of his birth was part of the Italian state of Piedmont, ruled by the Habsburgs. Garibaldi began his adult life as a seaman and eventually earned the rank of captain. His life took a turn when he met revolutionary Giuseppe Mazzini, the leader of the Giovanni Italian movement. He took part in a failed military mutiny to overthrow the Piedmont government and was condemned to death. Garibaldi fled to Brazil. Garibaldi lived in South America for 12 years, taking part in many revolutionary activities. He learned the art of guerrilla warfare and discovered his natural leadership qualities and charisma attracted many soldiers to fight by his side. By the time he returned to Italy in 1848, he already had a reputation for his heroic deeds. Back in Italy, Garibaldi fought to build his dream of an Italian Republic. He once again attracted many to fight with him, but after many battles and changing political alliances, Garibaldi found himself on the losing side. He went to New York, where he lived and worked with Antonio Meucci, an Italian immigrant who has been proven to be the real inventor of the telephone. The Garibaldi Meucci Museum in Staten Island is devoted to the time these men spent together. The quiet life was not for Garibaldi, however. 
he returned to South America and once again went to sea as a captain. He earned enough money after a few years to return to Italy and buy a farm on the island of Caprera. In 1859, the Second War of Italian Independence broke out and Garibaldi returned to military life. He ultimately formed the famous army called the Cacciatori degli Alpi, the Hunters of the Alps, and succeeded in liberating the north of Italy from Austrian control. Garibaldi then turned his efforts to liberating the south of Italy. With a thousand volunteers, he landed at Marsala on the western coast of Sicily. After a series of ferocious battles against the French, he ultimately crushed them, took Palermo, and crossed into the mainland of Italy, finally arriving in Naples, where he was celebrated for his victory. Garibaldi distrusted the Pope and wished to eliminate his political control over the Papal States in the center of Italy. Garibaldi had dominated the North and the South, but at the Battle of Montana to capture Rome, he was wounded and captured. He was released soon after, however. Garibaldi continued to advocate against the papacy. He said, it is in vain that my enemies try to make me out an atheist. I believe in God. I am the religion of Christ, not the religion of popes. I do not admit any intermediary between God and man. Priests have merely thrust themselves in in order to make a trade of religion. They are the enemies of true religion, liberty and progress. They are the original cause of our slavery and degradation and in order to subjugate the souls of Italians, they have called in foreigners to enchain our bodies. After the Second War of Italian Independence, President Abraham Lincoln offered Garibaldi a high post in the Union Army during the Civil War. He refused, despite his great admiration for Lincoln. He was elected to the Italian Parliament and in 1879, he founded the League of Democracy which advocated universal suffrage, emancipation of women, and the creation of a standing Italian army. Although his dream of an Italian Republic was not realized in his lifetime, Garibaldi was pleased to accept a unified, free, and democratic nation under the monarchy of Victor Emmanuel. Garibaldi's military achievements rank him as one of the greatest generals of the past 300 years, earning him the title of the hero of two worlds, a reference to his conquests in Italy and South America. Around the turn of the century, Italians were immigrating to the USA by the thousands. Most were poor Southern Italians who were desperate to find prosperity in America. Unfortunately, they also brought with them the criminal scourge that had plagued Italy for hundreds of years, as it was known then, la mano nera, or the black hand. Italian immigrants, poor and fearful of the police in their new home, were unmercifully terrorized by having to pay the pizza, or protection money, or by suffering abductions of their loved ones for outrageous ransoms. One courageous Italian immigrant came forward to fight this evil. Giuseppe Joe Petrosino. Petrosino was born in Padula, Italy in 1860. He was sent over as a young boy with his cousin to live with their grandfather in New York City. When his grandfather was killed in a streetcar accident, a kindly judge in the orphan's surrogate's court took both boys home with him until the rest of the Petrosino family arrived in New York in 1874. It is speculated that his time spent with this politically connected Irish judge and his family opened up avenues of possibility not usual for Italian immigrants of that time. It is not known if those connections allowed him to get a position with the New York City police in 1883. Petrosino was only five foot three inches tall, below the minimum required, but he did get a waiver to join the force. Fluent in several Italian dialects, his ability to solve crimes in the Italian community was legendary. Whenever a serious crime took place among Italian immigrants, his superiors would send for him. On July 20, 1895, Police Commissioner Theodore Roosevelt 
promoted him to detective sergeant in charge of the homicide division. But the peak of his career came in December 1908, when he was promoted to lieutenant in charge of the new Italian squad or Italian Legion. This was a group of elite Italian-American policemen put together specifically to fight crime organizations such as the Mano Nera. Petrosino worked tirelessly to fight the shame upon decent Italians and Italian-Americans. Petrosino handled many important cases in his career, but one of his most famous involved the great Italian operatic tenor Enrico Caruso. While under contract to the Metropolitan Opera in New York, Caruso was threatened by the Mano Nera. Petrosino convinced Caruso to work with the police, and he solved the case. Another important case involved Vito Cacioferro, a low-level Mano Nera member. In 1903, Petrosino charged him with murder, but he was acquitted. Cacioferro then returned to Sicily, and over time became a high-ranking crime lord. Over a hundred years later, in 2014, during an unrelated investigation by Italian police, a descendant of Paolo Palazzotto claimed his ancestor was Petrosino's assassin, executing Cacioferro's hit on Petrosino in Palermo in 1909. Petrosino had been sent to Italy on what he believed was a top secret mission. A recently passed federal law allowed the government to deport any alien who had lived in the country for less than three years if that alien had been convicted of a crime in another country. Petrosino was armed with a long list of known Italian criminals who had taken up residence in the United States and intended to get enough evidence of their criminal pasts to throw them out of the country once and for all. However, Theodore Bingham, the incompetent police commissioner of New York at the time, gave the story of Petrosino's mission to a New York newspaper while Petrosino was abroad. It was believed that the Mafia got wind of his mission from this mistake. On February 28th, Detective Joe Petrosino arrived in Palermo. A few hours later, he met the American consul, but avoided the Italian police. He said, I do not trust them at all. Here I learned things that would make your hair stand on end. He told the consul of his intention to extend the investigation not only to the Mafia, but also to the candidates in the upcoming elections. On March 12, 1909, Petrosino received a message from someone claiming to be an informant, asking the detective to meet him in the city's Piazza Marina to give him information about the Mafia. Petrosino arrived at the rendezvous, but it was a trap. While waiting for his informant, Petrosino was shot to death by Mafia assassins. Funeral rites for Petrosino were performed in Palermo, after which his body was sent to New York. On April 12, 1909, Funeral rites were once again conducted in St. Patrick's Cathedral, with over 200,000 people taking part in the funeral procession. New York City declared the day of his burial a holiday to allow its citizens to pay their respects. Petrosino was one of the most courageous and successful crime fighters in the history of the NYPD. At least three movies were made of his life and exploits, and books have been written about him. He is truly one of the greatest Italian-American heroes of all time.